With Purim Katan this week, just days away, the 14th and 15th of Adar Rishon, what does that mean? What do we have to do? Do we have to do anything? How do we celebrate? That's what we're going to be discussing on this episode of The Jewish Shrinking Show, bringing L'chaim to life. L'chaim. We're in Adar 1. We're in the first Adar. Happens five, I think five or seven out of every 19 years, something like that. Seven out of every 19 years. So it's yeah. not every year. It's not every other year, but maybe every third year, roughly. Um, sometimes every two years, sometimes every three years. The last time we had it was actually two years ago, but next one will be in three years from now, another three years after that, another. So it's it's not really that frequent, but not that infrequent either. It's not the most obscure thing, but it's not something we do every year, the, having a double Adar. And I don't know that there'd really be a question about what to do on 14 Adar and 15 Adar, except for the Mishnah. We have this Mishnah here in text number one. Part of us on the Gila Adar Rishon. If you read the Megillah during the first Adar, in this Barah Hashanah, the year of winter of Kormosa, Kormosa of the Adar Rishon. One reads during the second Adar. In vain, Adar Rishon, Adar Shani. The only difference between the first Adar and the second Adar, Al Kriyas and Megillah, and the Council of God. It is the reading of the Megillah and the gifts of the poor in the second Adar. Awesome, thank you. So, there's two different things going on. The first is kind of like this Theoretical. What happens if you read the Megillah in the first Adar on 14 Adar, or I guess if you're in Yerushalayim or any walled city in the 15th, and then subsequently it was then added a whole separate second Adar, what counts? Like, do, do you have to go back and do it? That is not our concern. That's not our reality. What is our reality is the second part here, that, they're only, that the only difference between these two Adars are these two matters, right? Megillah reading, and gifts to the poor. Those are the only differences according to the Mishnah. Yes, exactly. You you figured it out. That's <laughs> that is the crux of the entire it's evening. Really, it, yes, it almost doesn't make sense. I mean, the yeah. only thing that makes yeah. sense yeah. is uh, is uh, the gifts to the poor. Yeah, that's assigned to the second aga. Yeah, but it doesn't say anything about. It doesn't even say if you read the Megill in the first aga. Oops, you made a mistake. Oh, that's Actually, true. Actually, it says, okay, yeah. you read it in the first Adar. <laughs> but it doesn't, but is it suggesting that it's mandatory to read? That is, if you read the Megillah in the first Adar, mm. is it mandatory to read the Megillah in the second Adar? Mm. It's not, to me, it's not really clear mm -hmm. from this mission. I do want to point out more to this piece that there's no difference aside from these two practices because that still leaves open the door for which other practices? And Shalakwanos. Yep, Shalakwanos. And um, Suda. Yeah, and, and enjoying and rejoicing at it, right? Because that's one of the things that it says in the Megillah is that they're meant to be yimei mishteh v'simcha, of drinking days and joyousness. So that, uh, so presumably that's also in place and along with the Mishlach yeah. And it doesn't mention it. So you still have to do those two, but not these two? Well, there's uh, potentially. That leads to potentially, the question. Potentially. All right. Right. Definitely a question. Right. Now we have text two, which is also a Tanayitic text. Megillah 6b 15 to 17. It was taught if they read the Megillah during the first Adar and the year was then intercalated, which, which is funny because in the Hebrew it's just it was impregnated. <laughs> but they, intercalated. They read it during the second Adar as all ministers that are practiced during the second Adar are practiced in the first Adar except for reading of the Megillah. Makes even more sense. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. Rabbi Elazar, son of Rabbi Yossi, says they do not read it during the second Adar, as all mitzvahs that are practiced during the second are practiced during the first. There's no exceptions for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, from the name of Rabbi Yossi, they even read it during the second Adar, as all mitzvahs that are practiced during the second are not practiced during the first. And they all agree with regard to um, eulogy and with regard to fasting that they are prohibited on this and on that. Clearly, no matter what, oh, well, actually, I'll throw in text three as a little bit of a follow-up. We have these subsequent rabbis who say, Halacha is according to Rabbi Shimon ben Gamli, who said from Rabbi Yosef. So we don't have to be left hanging. Uh, so clearly, one thing that is... Utterly clear is no eulogies and no fasting. 
On both the 14th and... Both months. Uh, yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. On both I the 14th... Really month. Well, for... Uh, let's say the 14th and the 15th. I don't know if it's also the 15th. But definitely the 14th. Both months. Utterly clear. No fasting. No eulogizing. Presumably because there's a happiness to the day, right? It's not meant to be just like any other random day. What they're saying is, which, by the way, what's at stake? This is a week from now. So how do we how are we going to go about our lives one week from now? I, I don't know that anybody's going to go around fasting or eulogizing, but that they're they're trying to promote that this is not just a regular day. This is our fa foundation. This is our groundwork. This is what we need to know. That there doesn't seem to be a, a uh, the the really important thing that comes out of text two and three. I will say is that really it's the second Adar reading that's the important one for. 14th, 15th of Adar. That is the most important. Mm -hmm. The second most important thing is also no fasting, no eulogizing. That also, I don't believe there's any debate subsequent to that. That is also ironclad. But for both Adars. For both Adars, exactly. No eulogizing, no fasting on 14th or 15th and Adar 1 or 2. I think really maybe the sort of not really clear thing is what we read in the Mishnah versus what we read from Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamaliel quoting Rabbi Yosef. I think that's um, what what exactly are the differences? Hey there, it's Adar. This is a Purim episode. If you want to find out more Purim episodes or just simply other resources about Purim, feel free to check out jewishdrinking.com slash Purim. Again, jewishdrinking.com slash Purim for resources, articles, essays, clips, and so much more all about Purim. Thank you. Now back into the episode. When we get to the medieval stuff, we get to the Rishonim. This is where it starts getting a little exciting, a little dynamic. It's, you know, to some degree, kind of a little bit like the, the Wild West. You know, people have their opinions. We have Tosvot, which is, could be anybody. There's a whole bunch of people who are part of that, that collection of, uh, of commentators. Usually grandchildren, great-grandchildren of Rashi, um, and so forth. Tosvot on Megillah 6B19.1. And Rabbi Alazar, um, the Rabbi Yossi Halls, even the reading of the scroll. I assume that's in the Gila, right? Mm -hmm. on, yeah. at, the, at the outset, I didn't, on the yeah. first, and it appears mm -hmm. that he made a precise inference from from that which it taught an extra teaching in the Mishnah. That all the commandments that are practiced in the second practiced in the first, which applies at the offset <coughs> and there are some that are accustomed to making days of drinking parties and joy on the 14th and 15th of the first Adar. Huzzah! There we go. Yeah. Huzzah. And the quick reading of our Megillah, uh, of our Mishnah, also implies this, as it says that there's no difference between the two months except for the scroll and the gifts to the poor. From this, it is implied that concerning the matter of drinking parties and joy, this and that, both months are the same. <laughs> and this is not lucid. So I'm going to pause this here. So far, he's saying, taking face value, what we read in the Mishnah, <laughs> no difference aside from Megillah reading and Mishloch, uh, I'm sorry, Matana Le'abionim, the gifts to the poor. Those are the only two differences. So he says, look, that means clearly drinking parties and joy are totally the same both months. No difference. Uh, according to that uh, straight read of the Mishnah. Okay. So he's being right. So he's taking that. But now he's going to touch upon what we read in text two. As behold, we say in the Gemara concerning the matter of eulogies and fast, this and that both months are the same. For this is implied that peace and enjoy are not treated the same in both months. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as per force, one is not dependent upon the other. As if, if, as if one were dependent upon the other, let the Gemara make us understand that drinking parties and joy are practiced on the 14th and 15th of a parsada, and automatically it would be forbidden for eulogies. As behold, the days that are mentioned in 
Gilad Hanit mm -hmm. that are forbidden for eulogies also do not have drinking parties in joy. So we see that drinking parties implies not having eulogies, even if having no eulogies, does not imply drinking parties. And so is so is the the law that there is no need to be stringent to make drinking parties and joy in the first of God. All right, thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, he he trots out the mission. He says, look, they should be exactly the same. But then when he's quoting Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamaliel, quoting Rabbi Yossi, saying, <clears throat> really the only the has uh, has made um, eulogies and the fasting. That's the difference. But presumably, what's lacking there is the drinking parties and the the mishdav simcha. The saying, wait a second, but maybe we don't have that in our rishon. Maybe we don't have that. So maybe that's not really all the same. So he's not so sure about that's that's now provoking him to have doubt about this. And then ultimately, this is what leads his to his conclusion. Uh, which is really fascinating language. And therefore, the halacha, the practice, is that we do not need to be stringent. Uh, he, he uses the language of, of, of stringency in order to make drinking parties and, and joyousness, right? Um, that meaning that one who is stringent in this matter is someone who engages in drinking parties Right. On the fourteenth of Adar, that is someone who is stringent, right. someone who is leaning in this matter. Says we don't need to do anything, um, which is an interesting yeah. description of of stringency in this matter. Um, and it also seems to imply that you don't. Basically, the he is advocating that the bottom line halacha is you don't need to do anything on fourteen Adar Rishon. But the only thing that's okay, so you don't need to do anything out of the normal. Don't fast. Don't eulogize. Yeah. Aside from that, live your life. It's normal. How does he get that drinking is not limited? He is saying, so I wouldn't use the word limited. I, I, I really do think his language, I'm going to use his language. No one else has talked about it before. He's introducing this notion that you need to, just whereas for Adar, regular Adar, right, a regular Purim, you need to drink. And therefore, with Adar Shani, you need to drink on the 14th of Adar. You need to have a drinking party. You need to be happy. He is saying, do we really need to be stringent and require that you need to drink and be happy on 14th Adar Rishon? That, that would be, in his language, that is the highest fulfillment. It's not really, he's basically saying, it's really unclear whether we need to or not. Those who want to act stringently and say, let's drink on 14th Adar Rishon. And those who are leading say, well, we don't need to. He's not saying it's limited. He's saying you can do both, you know. But we, it, it, maybe it's too much of a, a strain on people to also have a drinking party and enjoying themselves on 14th Adar Rishon. What is Mishra Dukhatila in this translation? That the practices you do in the second one, you should also, at the outset, uh, strive to do them even in the first Adar. And then that's what leads them to say, Vyesh. And there are some shinogin lasos yimei mishdavi simcha ba'ar ba'asar hamishos social adar rishon. And there's some who say that are argue that um, actually he, he's not even saying they're arguing. And he doesn't also he also doesn't use the language of being machmir. He just says this is how they're accustomed. This is what they do, which is also a, a, a also a fascinating language because it gets us out of the strict legalistic language of stringency requirements. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of like a little bit par like uh, adjacent, mm -hmm. which saying. This is what they do. This is their practice. He knows he's writing, and he knows of people in his time that are doing this. On Adar, uh, 14 Adar Rishon, they're having their drinking parties. So imagine the culpability of a judge. They know you have to do it. <laughs> right. So he said, I, right, he's saying, I know of these people. I know they do this. This is their practice. Ultimately, when it really comes down to it, what is the legalistic framework for this? I don't think, and, and by the way, he could have just simply said, um, he didn't even have to use the word lachmir. He could have just said, he could have simply said, we don't need to do this. It's fascinating he's using the language, we don't need to be stringent to do this. So he's he thinks that this is maybe people who want to really maximally uh, get the most out of 14 Adar Rishon, 
that they are going above and beyond. He doesn't believe that that's um, sort of the baseline practice that everybody should be doing. Something we're going to have to keep in our minds for, throughout the duration of this is what is at stake or what is really at stake. Basically, according to the Gemara, is there really anything much at stake on the first Adar or the 14th of Adar? There's not really a whole lot at stake. Fine, don't fast, don't eulogize. That's really all you need to do. What about drinking and enjoying yourself? Not really clear. Clearly in his time, he knows the people enjoying themselves. He's not really sure of it. But what happens if you don't? What if you fail to accomplish drinking parties on forum and the first Adar? Well, it's not really clear. Like, have you really missed the mark? There's not a huge, there's not really, yeah, you'll be sad. But there's not really a huge, it's not a sin. You know, it's not like, oh, you missed doing this. Miss. Like, there's, it doesn't seem to be like a lot that you're really missing out on. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's right. Listen to interesting considerations. Like, what's really ultimately at stake? When we look at text five, which is, which is interesting, so Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher quotes Rabbi Yitzchak ben uh, Yaakov al Fasi, the riff. He quotes him, 11th century. This very significant Talmudic commentator said, You do need to increase one's meal on the 14th of Adar Rishon. You do. Um, and he's not using the language of custom or practice. You do need to, but not on the 15th. <laughs> which is interesting. On the 14th, absolutely. You don't need to on the 15th. Um, and then he says, my father, I guess, was not a big fan of that. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. After all, it is Adar. We're talking Purim. I want to give you a sneak peek into our next Purim episode, which will be taking place in a couple weeks. Here we go. And the cook really pushes back on that and says, well, wait a second. We have a principle in Halacha, Oseik Pah Mitzvah, Pater Mitzvah. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're involved in doing one mitzvah, you're exempt from doing other mitzvahs. He says, "Look, if we hold there's a mitzvah to drink on Purim, so then if you miss out on another mitzvah because because you were fulfilling the mitzvah drinking on Purim, so that's no big deal." I hope you enjoy that sneak peek featuring Rabbi David Fried, which ep- which that episode will be coming out in two weeks. So I hope you feel free to come back and check that out. But for the meantime, let's go back into this episode. So Rabbi Yosef Caro course, famed author of the Shulchan Aruch, but also uh, a much more voluminous work of his uh, that preceded his work in the Shulchan Aruch was his, as I like to call it, Joseph's House, Beit Yosef, which is a really, really, really fascinating work. And in as much as the Shulchan Aruch is really good, and especially for its, um, I don't want to say simplicity, it's brevity, especially for its brevity, it's very approachable. Is Beit Yosef is not as approachable, but it is really good in that he provides a lots of um, kind of like a survey of previous literature on any given topic. So it's actually really useful for that. But for the purpose of sending fortune, since it's comparable to uh, sending gifts to the poor. Which is only in the second order. This implies that even sending portions is only for the second order. I want to pause you there. So one thing we hadn't really talked about, which was ambiguous, what do we do about Mishloch Manot? Matan Levionim was very clear for the Mishnah. We don't do that in first order. But what about Mishloch Manot? So there seems to be he's uh, I don't remember exactly who he's quoting, but that this is really just yeah, this is another. We'll, we'll package it together. Matan Levionim and Mishloch Manot. Both of these, uh, since they're both sending portions of people, let's restrict that or to use Ray's language, limit it only to the second other. Because what wrote, and there are some that are accustomed to making days of drinking parties and enjoying themselves in the 14th and 15th of the first hour. And the quick reading of our Mishnah also implies this, but this is not lucid. And behold, it says in the Talmud, concerning the matter of eulogies and fast, this and that, both months, are the same. From this, it is implied that feasting and joy are not treated the same in both months. And so the rule is that there is no need to be stringent to make drinking parties in joy. And Mayor Cohen, end of the 13th century, wrote in his Hagaot Mamanot Mamanit, quoting Rabbi Yitzchak from Yosef and Korbel, who died in the 1280s, sorry, he died in the 1280s, but quoting his, his Sefer Mitzvah, Katan. That throughout the world, people are generally accustomed to making drinking parties, nor merriment, only on 14th hour, Rishon, 
even though people are constantly making merriment and drinking parties on both 14th and 15th of honor chain. And the reason on account of the Talmudic statement that there is no difference between 14th of honor and it doesn't mention 15th of honor to be shown, and perhaps I mentioned it since 14th of honor is the main day. But regarding doing labor, there is no prohibition of doing so on the first day, unless it is a locale where they are accustomed. I'm going to pause you there again. Sure. The what he the person he's quoting who apparently is quoting someone else is this is what people do. People do this on 14th of Adar Rishon. No one is careful to do this on the 15th of Adar Rishon, but on the 14th of Adar Rishon, yeah, this is something we're doing that we see people doing. Uh, which, by the way, seems pretty similar to what Tosfot quoted. I know those people, right? There are people who practice this on the 14th of Adarishon. They do this. That's great. But not. But not but oh, but now. Sorry, that's oh, a typo. Okay, now, they are accustomed to increasing our feasting on neither the 14th nor 15th of the first hour. Nevertheless, we are accustomed to not fall on our faces, mm -hmm. uh, nor to stay Psalm 20, since the end of uh, Mizmor of Yan Chab Yom, um, uh, yeah, Mizmor Yan Chan Rabbi Yom Tsarai. Since they are days of miracles and so it's interesting because he, he he's quoting these, and certainly Tosfo, who, yeah, he quotes Tosfo who says, I know these people who are doing this, and this other, this Rabbi Mary Coin who's quoting Rabbi Yisrael Ben Yosef Korbet. Yeah, we, you know, this is something that people all over are doing. So clearly in those centuries, uh, definitely the 13th century, people were, this is pretty common when it comes to Adarishon on the 14th. This is a really common widespread practice at that time. And then now, by the time it gets to Beit Yosef, he's saying, I don't see this happening. This isn't what we're doing nowadays, mm -hmm. which is really interesting um, that it was going on in medieval era, but by Rabbi Yos by Rabbi Cairo's time, that wasn't common practice. Where are you, where is the Tosfos written? In, in Franco-Germany. And the Shulchan Aruch is written in Spain, correct? Um, it's like Turkey slash Israel. Turkey and Israel. The Ottoman Empire, basically. That is all background. Rabbi Cairo here is clearly aware in text six of these, in his sort of uh, <laughs> survey of literature, so to speak. Now, in the more brief, as we see in text seven, does anybody want to read this? This is how he frames it in the Shulchan Aruch. As you'll see, this is massively smaller. 14th and then the 15th day of other one. We do not fall upon our faces. I start talking. This isn't one of right? And we do not say Psalm 20. A psalm the Lord unto you, and on those days it is forbidden to eulogize or fast. There are those who say that even eulogy and fasting are permitted. Which is, by the way, the way he ends it is really phenomenal. Like, wait, even eulogizing and fasting might be permitted according to some authorities, which is fascinating. But one thing he absolutely does not talk about is drinking. He doesn't talk about at all drinking. He doesn't say maybe there are some. Blah, blah, blah. He just. Absolutely omits it. He's not even going to bother mentioning it. And he just wrote all this stuff we saw in the previous one. He, he's aware in previous centuries that these were common practices, uh, but he ultimately says, this isn't our practice nowadays. And then he, as you see, he didn't even bother writing. He didn't even, you know, spill any ink on that for this, for the Shulchan Aruch. Text 8. This is Rabbi Yisrael writing in Krakow, Poland. I was to say that one is obligated to increase in drinking and joy and yeah, yeah. Um, but we are not accustomed to that. Nevertheless, one should increase their feasting slightly in order to fulfill the opinion of those who are stringent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, I guess, referring to Rabbi Yitzhak mm Kohen, -hmm. 13th century according to the Yitzhak Kohen. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, has a continual drinking. Awesome. Thank you. Suggesting that okay. right. Okay to drink right. So, but before we get to the way he closes it, which is a kind of curious uh, closing, he, he brings these three pieces, so to speak. So, the first is there are some, like the Riff, who say you should definitely do this. This is a requirement. How we should observe the 14th of Adoration. This is required. Then he says, well, this isn't how we practice. And then he brings that third piece, which is, well, there are plenty who say, you know what? Maybe we should 
at least slightly increase our feasting in order to fulfill the opinions of those who say we should. So it, it's basically a compromise position. Mm -hmm. He's saying some say we should. Do we really need to? That's not a practice. So maybe a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. Just a little bit. And then you can, you know, fulfill whatever, you know, those opinions out there. Yeah, yeah. So you can... Um, right, so you, you don't have to feel guilty. D I didn't do anything about this date on the calendar. He just said he can add a little bit. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> right. Um, so the way he signs off, it's this, this uh, excerpt of a quote from Proverbs of that, uh, you know, the good-hearted... Tov Lev literally means good-hearted, but it, it Lev is usually in these contexts more about a mental um, sort of disposition, uh, saying that someone's always at a, at a sort of a drinking party, uh, always. Now, this is, I'm going to share this, and I think it gets brought up, or maybe I, I cut it out. A lot of subsequent writers are trying to figure out, what does this mean? It feels kind of, uh, well, it's definitely curious. Maybe it's slightly mysterious. Why, why is he closing off this way? Turns out, by the way, this this section is the end of, so the four sections of the Shulchan Aruch, we have Yoradeh, we have Kosh Mishpat, we have Evan Ezra, and we also have Orachayim. So this is the final uh, section in Orachayim. And so the way he, so some try to tie it back, I, I was listening to something recently, that this line ties back to something he mentions in the very beginning, uh, which also used the word Tamid, and that there's sort of this like literary envelope of connecting both the way he opens Orachayim and with this line, the way he closes. Hey there, I wanted to break in yet again. Although I ask for support in financial ways because it does cost some money to make the hosting happen and other aspects of Jewish drinking happen. So your financial support is definitely appreciated. And don't forget, you can go to jewishdrinking.com slash donate. But also another way of supporting the show and everything that Jewish drinking does is also to tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you like this content, if you like this show, maybe people you know also like it. So feel free to let them know, hey, I have this interesting episode I heard, or a few episodes, or whatever it is, or even a few clips. Feel free to share with your friends. All right, thank you so much. Now back into the show. post Shulchan. So text nine, I'm going to quickly go through. It, this is actually a commentary. This is Rabbi Spira. His commentary is actually on a work called the Lavush, which is, is actually somewhat contemporaneous to the Shulchan Aruch-ish. But his commentary is actually really significant. So he says it's inferable even on the 15th. You know, we, we were reading that, who really cares about the 15th of Adar Rishon? We care about the 14th, right? He says, maybe even also the 15th. Who's to say not the 15th of Adar Rishon? He says it is simply similarly inferable. Uh, but he says, and, you know, but Rabbi Yitzhak's language uh, seems to infer not on the 15th. Now he says, and it's possible that it's included with how he concludes, and a good-minded person always enjoys drinking parties, right? So it's interesting that he's one of these, a lot of these, a lot of these subsequent commentators pick up on the closing of Rabbi Yitzhak's of saying, well, maybe we should be encouraged to have drinking parties uh, wherever possible, and he's saying, why do we have to restrict ourselves just the 14th of Adar Rishon? Why not also the 15th of Adar Rishon? Right? So that's a, also an interesting direction to go, which is kind of interesting, especially in the diaspora, really anywhere outside of any walled city. It doesn't have to be the diaspora. Like, do we have to really concern ourselves with the 15th? Uh, how important is that really? 14th is already a, a step in one direction that you're making a commitment. The 15th? Um, he's like, but maybe also, and he's a Polish rabbi for, you know, just for geographical context. Uh, actually speaking of Polish rabbis, text number 10 is also another Polish rabbi who was preceded him. And I realized this was out of chronological order. David Olivier Siegel. No. Uh, mm -hmm. the is out of the Shokmarach or the Rashim Shem Ben Tzadik, who died in 1312, wrote that one should increase and Rabbi Yechiel of Paris. Was accustomed to 1268. Was accustomed to increase and to invite people, according to the straightforward understanding of the mission. The only difference between Adar Rishon and Adar Shein is the reading the Megillah and gifts to the poor. And it, it is good. It is good, however, Moshe Issa concludes here 
And a good minded person always enjoys drinking. <laughs> and this is the Taz. And so, where's Elia Rava, who, you know, in his own way is a significant halachic writer, but Taz, Rabbi Levi Siegel, he's a very significant commentator on the Shulchan Aruch. He says, look, there were these 13th, 14th century rabbis uh, who were writing, or, well, actually, Rabbi Yechiel of Paris was accustomed to do these things. Rabbi Shimon ben Zadik wrote. Th this was common practice. I wonder how much they were contemporaries of Tosfo who was talking about, oh, I know those people who do this sort of thing. And these are clearly the type of people who would be within that. The kind of new thing, I, I don't know how much of it a new thing is, to increase whether you're increasing your meals, but he's saying this Rebbe Yechiel Paris would also invite people. It's not just, mm -hmm. I'll throw in a you know, little extra fish or a little extra brownie or whatever. I'm going to have people over. We're going to make this, you know, yeah. But no one says you can't do that. I mean, what we read before, right, that's true. What we read before was that, okay, we'll hedge. Right. Make it somewhat special. Yeah. This way you distinguished that day from the other days. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's limited. You mm -hmm. can still have a Suda. He, yeah. I mean, he, didn't, he didn't say, oh, you can't have a Suda. Right. He just said, you at least need to make it different. Yeah. Rabbi, Rabbi Hayan, Mordechai, Mar... Margolito, thank you. Margolito. Margolito. Jari Teshuva on Shulchan Aruch, Orach Chaim. 697. Um, it's possible to say that according to what Rabbi Isolis wrote earlier in 670, in the gloss on section 2 regarding Hanukkah, that there are those who say that there is a bit of a of mitz of mitzvah with increasing best feasting and we are accustomed to sing songs and praises at a feast where we are increasing with them which would then be a mitzvah meal i'm going to pause there so this is it's funny when we were reading the rabbi Yitzhak, it made me think about this so I'm glad I'm not the only person ever to think about this. Rabbi Margolios here was thinking the same thing. He said, this language of, you know, maybe just add a little bit to your meal and boom, you'll be okay, right? Even for those who have these higher standards for how we should celebrate 14th of Adar Rishon, makes me think about Hanukkah. So when it comes to halachically speaking, what is the status of drinking on Hanukkah? So even though our minds are probably not in Hanukkah, even though it was just a couple of months ago, what is the deal with drinking on Hanukkah? It's a cold time of year, to be sure, right? So it's always nice to warm our bellies. But the, there's no strict requirement to drink on Hanukkah. But one of the fascinating things that Rabbi Yitzhak writes, which is we can see here, is, well, if, so A, you just add a little bit to your meal. So this, like, adding a little bit to your meal is the, the similar language, but also there by Hanukkah, he says to do some singing, do some, like, praising of God, and thereby, there'll be a, a little bit of a mitzvah meal. And so this is his connection he's making between Hanukkah and Purim, because, again, they're, bo they're both post-Torah, um, you know, rabbinic festivities, essentially. And so how are they in some way similar? From and from there we can learn that we should increase a little bit with Beeson Tuck fourteen other one. Mm -hmm. In order to fulfill the requirement for those who consider this matter matter stringently, that there is to accustom oneself to sing songs and praises, which then would be a mitzvah meal. Mm -hmm. And this is hinted at with Rabbi Isola's conclusion. And a good-minded person will always be drinking party. Mm -hmm. And this is according to what Rav Yehuda quotes Shmuel as saying in the Talmud. Look at the well, is it okay. that song? And is it that song is a fundamental <laughs> commandment from the Torah? And Rav Matan say that which service that is joyful and good-minded. This is so. Thank you. So now I will admit I do, I'm not, you know, I don't have the breath to really look at a lot of Rabbi Rabbi Margolius's stuff or specifically. I, I don't know how important song is to him. At the same time, it is really fascinating for him to say 
yeah, you should totally have drinking on the 14th of Outdoor Walk. That's a really great thing. You know what would be better than just drinking? Singing while drinking, which is like an intro. Like, that's a, such a different angle here. And he's saying it should be like Hanukkah. Yeah, you have a little bit more festive. You're getting together. You know what would be better? Singing. Um, which is like, well, and so where by Hanukkah, if you're singing while you're drinking, that makes it into a mitzvah meal. But here he's saying this also elevates it by the, the singing, which is um, I, I, no one else uh, tonight we've seen has advocated singing uh, while doing mm -hmm. this drinking. But it's an interesting. At the same time, it's not as if Purim parties are devoid of singing. Like there's all these special songs that happen that are ridiculous and, and uh, hilarious parodies that, that occur. Therefore, it is forbidden to eulogize or fast on Purim which is working to God Arisha, and we're thinking about Arisha. We do not fall on our faces when we say Psalm 20. We are not accustomed to perform other practices, but work is permissible. I'm going to pause this. I, one of the things that I find wildly fascinating is that nowhere in anything we've encountered so far has mentioned this terminology of Purim Katan. He is, at least, as, insofar as we've, and who knows, maybe it's been outside in, in other texts that I just didn't see before. But he's the first one, at least in what we've encountered, to really explicitly provide this nomenclature of, mm -hmm. it's not just simply 14th of Adar, Rishon. It's now Purim Katan. Um, mm -hmm. So now we have a different language for this. Anyway, okay. And some say that it is necessary to increase drinking parties of reverence on the 14th of Adar, Rishon. Although our practice is not as such, this is explicitly infer inferable, and the follow there is no obligation on the 14th of Adar. As Moshe Israelis wrote, nevertheless, one should slightly increase one's feasting in order to fulfill the requirement according to those who consider this matter stringent. And a good minded person is always drinking, which is to say that the primary serving of God is joyously. And therefore, his intentionality is for the purpose of mitzvah performance, which is the drinking party, which is the drinking dash party, drinking party, and enjoyment of mitzvah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly is endorsing. Yeah, this is a pretty strong endorsement. Yeah, He's, so he says at the outset, there's there's no obligation from the Talmud. Rabbi Moshe, Moshe Isilus never said less said this. So fine. <laughs> um, I kind of feel like it's like a wave where like it started with like basically fourteenth of water one, basically, and then it kind of moved to like maybe not. And now he's like bringing it back to be like, no, it's now small. Yeah. Um, I always enjoy Rabbi Epstein because he has these considerations and the deliberations and back and forth. It's fairly voluminous, but it's a nice, it's, it's, but nevertheless, it's a fairly simple deliberation. He's like, okay, it's good. Uh, so we're going to close off with a mission bureau. Rabbi Shimshon ben Sadok, uh, died 1312. Wrote that there is that there is to increase, and Rabbi Yehiel of Paris was a was accustomed to increase and to invite people. I don't know if that, mm -hmm. And this is how Rabbi Moshe Esau has concluded: that a good-minded person is continually enjoying drinking, and that it is good to increase one's drinking parties out of honor of the miracle that occurred during these times. All right, thank you. This is actually uh, not literally, but almost word for word, what text ten was the Taz. Right, so he basically lifts the Taz and they said the thing he does at the end here, however, is he says, It's still nevertheless good to increase in order, you know, for the purposes of, of honoring the miracle that occurred in uh, at these times then. So ultimately, like what we see is there are definitely those directions, especially flowing from the Mishnah, that there really is no difference. Maybe we should. We see these 12th, 13th century rabbis, especially in Europe, saying, "Let's or who, whether they're specifically advocating by writing or themselves practicing by having meals and inviting people, they are actively doing this. But they're also rabbis saying, do we really need to do this? Maybe we don't. If people want to be stringent, good for them. And then we see that, and then later by the time of Rabbi Cairo, he says, I was really doing this anymore. That was great, you know, earlier medieval times. That's, that's not really what we do. And then throughout the centuries subsequent to him, it, people seem to enjoy it. They, they derive value out of it. But I think there's also this pushback of saying, do we need to do it? We already have this a month later.
wonder if there's any element of the society they lived in, that is, how wealthy they were, how poor they were. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you live in a poor environment, mm -hmm. and you're having a pursuit of having you know, an excuse for a party, yeah. I mean, that's costly. Yeah, so, so I, I, I agree with you, not only the financial slash material context for these different, but I also wonder about the cultural context in addition to the material context of, or, or whether it's of the more uh, anti-Semitic of sort of like the repression that they're dealing with in their, their cultural context of like how really happy can they be versus maybe there's just like wasn't really what they did in that area. Of, of a sort of a cultural context? Is this really how we celebrate things? Do we need to bother with this? This isn't really how we normally are. And I think there are these different multiple pressures, both the cultural, material, and probably other pressures, uh, maybe external cultural pre pressures, uh, political pressures. So I think it, I, they obviously were not articulating those, aside from just saying, you know, at different times, yes, they were accustomed, no, they weren't, or we're not, or... or so it's it is interesting to see uh, throughout time it changes and and it's not linear either. It's not simply yes in, in a more direct yes fashion or more no. It, it's it's up and down all over the place throughout time mm -hmm. and also place. So ultimately, yeah. I mean, look, a week from now we'll be having fourteen out of Rishon. It's uh, uh, although it's it's yeah we should. Say, it's funny because when I was thinking about this, okay, well, you know, Thursday night, Friday, great time. And then they're like the 15th of Adar is Shabbos anyways. Like people are going to be enjoying this. Might as well. In recent years, though, it occurred instead of a Friday, Saturday, it was like a Monday. It was not as exciting of a day. And I imagine a lot of people, if they had to, if, you know, in recent years, if it's on a Monday, really, like I don't really feel like celebrating on a Monday. That's what I got on Adar Rishon.